ha, ha, nothing like playing with my gods. Uh, oh, oh, okay, uh, well, madam, what? Oh, um, I, I, I didn't know that you could, oh my, uh, you're, you're, you're that boy with the, oh, 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 no. Thank you to our final patrons, Sin is Lancelot, Art Goon, and Praise the Sun. And a big thank you to our noise, $69 tier patron, Brian. Now, before we hop into this breakdown slash review of chapter 61 of Fortnite of the Apocalypse, please do me a favor to leave your own notes on the chapter in the comments section down below. Leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, make sure you hit that little notification bell so you miss out on any videos that come to the channel. Also, also, I do have a Patreon down below. We can support you for as low as $1 a month. Any support would be appreciated. Now, let's get into two weeks ago's poll. So, with the final confirmed introduction of Gwain, Master of the Sun, we now have all four knights and their intro. So, of course, my question was, which one was your favorite? And with a landslide victory that I honestly couldn't help disagreeing with, or no, not disagreeing with, Lancelot came in with 64%, followed up closely by Gawain, well not closely, not closely at all, but followed up by Gawain at 15%, Tristan at 12%, and Percival at 9 Notably, I kind of knew that my favorite intro was pretty darn clear, it's one of my, I think I literally called it a 12 out of 10 chapter, just for the intro alone, and the follow up chapter was bomb too, so I like, obviously Lancelot, he had just a two go to an intro, man, like the, the, the dude went crazy on everybody there, and honestly, I, I feel like you couldn't really get much better than that, like, unless it was Arthur himself getting like neck slammed or something like that, like there's no way you could beat that intro, it was just too good, and I definitely respect Gawain being a good number, I'm about to say a good number three, a good number two, it was by far like the most mysterious yet at the same time hilarious yet at the same time cool intro like it had pretty much every single mix of flavor and bit that you could get with it especially in compared to tristan tristan sort of kind of just walked up and then kind of piggybacked off the craziness of his group and i obviously wasn't a big fan of that it doesn't look like many people were either however of course poor percival <laughs> like sure he's the main character sure he's the one we've spent the most time with but considering his intro is his intro chapter where he does nothing cool and he sort of just gets bullied it makes sense why he got the last spot. However, good poll. I'm glad we got 185 votes on that one. I love doing these polls to get the community consensus after these chapters drop. Make sure you get in for next week's poll dropping tomorrow at 12 p.m. So you don't get so you don't get to miss <laughs> so you don't get to miss out on getting your own input in for next video. Now let's get into chapter 61. What's up, guys? I'm with the pencil here, and here we are to chapter 61 of Four Nights of the Apocalypse, which is known as the Fourth Arrives, aka the Jump Begins, because. <laughs> oh my, <laughs> like that, that, that goes to show you how excited I am. However, there are like, <laughs> there's so many things we need to talk about. First, we gotta talk about this heat cover title chapter thing. So we have a good first in-depth color shot of Gawain, and I'm not gonna lie, kinda not rocking with the green. And, and like, it's not like, I don't know, for some reason, I feel like Nakaba can't do green. Like, what's a good green? Like, hold on, let me go to this next page. Like, there's not a single good green character color scheme. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not... I mean, Tristan's hair is all right, but like in terms of clothing, I've never seen Nakaba pull off green all too well. Actually, no, 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 never mind. Cause like, I like Meliodas' boar hat outfit at the start of season two. Like, I like that. Like the Ten Commandments arc outfit, those pants, like I think those work. But I don't know, everything else, I, I just can't, like I'm not rocking with the color of green. I feel like it's like the green matches her eyes, which I think is the point. And speaking of the, wait, no, we're forgetting to focus on the green first. I don't know, it's like, a, it's a weird muddyish swamp green. Too. But I get why he went for that, because like too much of a bright green would have been too much. I don't know, though. But just why green? Why not blue? Or maybe not blue, because Tristan has blue. Like I'm trying, I'm trying to think of the reasons why Nakaba would go with green. Notably, I don't think we have Tristan or Percival's final outfit yet. So I, I'm not sure. Maybe that's why Gawain is simply going green right now, because then it don't match. Because notably, red is already taken up by Lancelot. That's the majority of his outfit. Gold and blue is already taken up mostly by Tristan's outfit. And... Those are two very big colors that would be nice, and obviously gold would go well with gold-colored magic, but, you know, sacrifices had to be made. And currently, Percival's main two colors are orange and purple, so I, I guess that only leaves, like, green and 
green. So, so I guess it makes sense, but it's just, it's, it's a strange color. However, the rest, the rest is fine. And speaking of, once again, I did this during the live reaction. Fun fact, if you want uh, live reactions over on Patreon, just donate a dollar a month. I would greatly appreciate it. But I, I did this in the middle of the live reaction too, but now I'm about to do it once again. Let me go back to Escanor. Notably, actually, let me look up in Escanor. Oh my, Escanor color page. Because when I look up Escanor from the anime, he has like blue, blue, more blue eyes than green. Like no one, no one major off the top of my head. And I literally have this next page for reference. Like no one, except for Meliodas, ironically enough, has green eyes. And I don't, I don't think, I don't think this is Merlin and Meliodas. Let me not even, let me, let me get that cursed thought out of my head. But I don't think this is Merlin and Meliodas' love child. So I don't think that's the case. And yeah, Escanor has constantly shifting eyes. They're either blue, green, or gray. So obviously nothing taken from there. And Mael mostly norm normally off the top of my head, I believe he has blue eyes. <laughs> like, once again, let me just take a quick look. I but the thing is, Gawain is almost holistically unique, except for the fact that they look just like Merlin. <laughs> and that fact is exacerbated by the next page. But it's very, very interesting. It's cool to see Gawain having like resemblance to how do I put this so I, I this is the thing in Avatar right like the love of your next life is no 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 uh you you look like the previous I forget exactly how it goes I think it's you look like the previous person you loved once you get reincarnated so it makes sense that Escanor if this is Escanor's reincarnation or something like or this power it would make sense that his well at least in terms of that but i know that's that's different folklore is different religions I, once again i don't know anything about much of either of those religions that nakaba and or the avatar team base their stories off of but i do find it kind of coincidental that obviously escanor loved merlin and the next person to wield his power looks exactly like merlin like the, legitimately the only difference is that the hair is shorter and the eyes are a different color very very interesting very very interesting and once again, it's very cool to see Gawain with the gold-colored magic sword just radiating off their body, but their body themselves, once again, isn't undergoing any mutation. The magic seems either perfectly contained within them, so no, simultaneously perfectly contained within them, and perfectly in control out of their body. Like, normally, by a time of midday or so, whatever time this is supposed to be, like, Escanor, he would be flaring, he would have at least some, like, fire arcing off of him, but Gawain is in perfect control, essentially. There's no... She literally is the master. Like, there's nothing rippling off of her as no negative anything. And that's cool. That's cool. It's interesting. Like, I'm going to have a whole discussion towards the end of this review about how Nakaba's, like, leaping all over the place in a little bit in terms of what he wants to do with this series. But at the same time, it's great that we're diverging from Escanor in the sense that Escanor had very little control over the power and it mutated him and all that stuff. Like, we're, di we're diverging from that. So we still have the same power set. From the original series, but it's under a completely different context and a completely different person with completely different view, knowledge, and perspective of the power. And as we know now in Fortnite the Apocalypse, magic is truly malleable. It's how you view it. And obviously Gawain views Sunshine much less as a part of herself and much more as something that she controls, kind of like a servant. Meanwhile, Escanor viewed his magic as his magic. It was a part of him, something that he could barely control and he needed help controlling. So, in contrast to Escanor, someone who couldn't mold his mental around his magic, Gawain's mental is entirely molded around her magic, which makes their magics exactly the same, but fundamentally different. Really, really cool. I like how Nakaba's working that in. And also just the fine-tuned control. Like, the what, what I like the most about this opening panel is that it has that pure display of confidence. The smile on her face, the, the alignment of the eyebrows, everything just per... per I'm about to say pervades, provides that the exaggerated swagger of a sunshine teen, if you will. <laughs> I really, really appreciate that. However, enough of the first color page. Let's move on to the... Actually, she has a really long neck. But then again, <laughs> people have long necks. Let's move on to the next color page, which is the Seven Deadly Sins and the Four Nights of the Apocalypse. However, very interestingly enough, we get to see <laughs> Gawain isn't smiling i don't know like gawain just seemed like a person who would always be smiling whether it be like a confident smile or an arrogant smile but in this case they look a lot more intrigued and inquisitive rather than actually like haha like they don't they don't have the same confidence or bravado lance looks exactly as he should just 
narrow eyes narrowed 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 like he's just focused in lasered in as always that's lance's personality tristan once again seems happy go lucky that seems normal percy ugh, i'm not gonna lie despite percy being the main character and being featured in so many color pages i feel like nakaba does not know how to draw him yet <laughs> is that weird or no he knows how to draw him in the manga in black and white but I, I feel like whenever he tries to add color to Percy, it just gets weird. Like, out of all the four knights, Percy looks the weirdest. And this is, like, a multitude of factors. I think the colors are slightly off for what Nagama chose. I'm not sure if that's my computer or something. But maybe maybe it is, maybe it isn't. His colors seem slightly off. He went way too overboard on the lip detail in terms of, like, the coloration of the lips. Like, the smile's fine. Like, he's, Percy's always smiling. But in terms of, like, the coloration on the lips, it straight up looks like clown makeup. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. And the thing is, his lips themselves aren't, like, the cleft that's supposed to form his lip, his bottom lip, and separate from his chin. And at the same time, the top cleft that's supposed to form, like, his, his top lip and go away from his nose, it's not pronounced enough, so his face just looks like it's a round drop, and I, I'm criminally victim of this because i still can't draw well but like i'm a lot of critique it gosh darn it and overall no he just looks weird and also his <laughs> and i know i know y'all gonna be in the comments actually hey, yo pencil what you mean by that moment but even his skin coloration looks a bit all i say the same like bond looks more bond and percy look more tan than they should be meanwhile i'd say tristan and king look a little bit under tanned <laughs> like i don't know for some reason they look unbelievably pale <laughs> and the, and the thing is all, on all the characters in Millie the only characters that the lips look kind of normal on I mean I'm kind of used to Tristan having the lip just because we've seen that before but the only thing yeah like it, it, does, it doesn't even look right on Meliodas the only person who looks normal with the lips is Diane Merlin Eskinor because he doesn't have it Gawain looks fine with it uh lance lance looks all right guys this is supposed to come from his mom like he's supposed he's supposed to have more effeminate features anyway because because of his mom that was a lot more evident in his younger design before he cut his hair but still and it looks fine on bond but i think that's it kind of, for the most part looks fine on bond i'm not even gonna lie and bond where are you looking at my boy where, like glaring high in the sky but regardless very very uh, off the lip thing I'm, I'm sorry i know i went on a whole weird tangent about the lips the rest of it the height's also weird i'm not gonna lie <laughs> like percival is taller than tristan i know it's a whole perspective thing and i know like i'm the biggest height thing is that diane is at all there taller than taller than bond which is canon but way too short and escanor i guess that's just supposed to like that's nighttime escanor but he looks serious, like daytime Eskinor. I don't know. It's a really cool shot, regardless. And also, Merlin's body proportions seem really, really off. Actually, hold on. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, because that, that's like her knee is further down within the. I'm sorry. I know I'm going like super. And why is Eskinor the only one wearing his armor, and not his just traditional outfit? Like, I, I'm sorry. I know I'm hopping left, right, up and down everywhere. But I'm literally just looking at the drawing and pointing out things that catch my eye. I really, I, I will admit, I really like Lance's color, color colorization here and how it's so like i'd say it's so close to bond's coloration but it's just that slight bit off which fits i think that fits a lot i really like the eye color that they that nakaba chose for lance in this picture too it's like slightly as it has more white accent and is slightly just slightly paler once again slightly off from bond's own eye color which i think works i like the I actually like the armor this time a whole lot more, <laughs> though, the, or Tristan's whole outfit a whole lot more than the last time we saw it in a color page, and I think it's just because that jarring blue isn't there. Like, the gold works a whole lot better now. Just the gold and silver combined way, way better than it was before. Shout out to Nakaba for the improvement on that. I'm not going to get on Percival, no matter how much I want to get on him, because, ugh, I don't know, he does look weird. But Diane looks fine. Little, little creepy, not going to lie. The whole face is kind of serial unaliver ish i think that's mainly because like she's further in the background and not in the foreground and thus like knock about to concentrate her whole eye down so you barely get to see the purple so it kind of just looks like one big old pupil or one big old iris and it's locked in and the, it's just the, the smile itself it, just because of how tiny it is it's so it's drawn a bit off so it looks like i will eat you like it it's very very off but you know it's fine it's fine king once a, i don't know something I feel like you could have made the eye a little bit, like, make the eye Meliodas size, and it wouldn't be as concerning. It's just the, the concentration on it. Like, Gother's eyes look... Like, Gother, honestly, next to Lance, is 
No, Lance and Gawain look fine. I'd say Lance, Gawain, and Eskinor looks fine too. He's just small. <laughs> Eskinor, Lance, Gawain, Bon, they all look fine along with Gother. Like Gother is perfectly drawn here. I like the hair. I like the coloration. All that's normal. Even the lips works fine with Gother because that's just a part of Gother's character. But yeah, King looks also a little bit serial and aliveish, like almost Joker esque with the lip filling and the smile and the zoomed in eye. I don't know. It feels kind of weird. Melodius also just looks weird with the lips. I'm not gonna lie. Like I, I specifically can't even remember a time he was drawn with lips before. Like I think at least everyone else here may have had. Nah, I can't remember King <laughs> drawn like that either. But like Meliodas doesn't even look like Meliodas just because of the lips. Like I, I'm not sure if editing. No, I don't think editing me will have the time today if it wants. Like. Recording me is thinking of how much I need to talk about in this chapter and thinking of how much editing me is already gonna have to edit this opening section And then I'm like, I'm not sure if editing me would have the time But if you do have the time future editing me or maybe I'll post it on Instagram or something I want to edit out the lips <laughs> See if it, see if that would make it look a little bit more normal if they were just regular 7 million sins right without the extra lip I've, Really really cool color page. I love I love how it's like the transition and there's a lot of confidence in the previous group, like, everyone's smiling. The only person who looks, like, sli even slightly unconfident is Eskinor. That's just because he looks stoic. Meanwhile, every single one of the Sins are smiling onto their future, which is the Four Knights of the Apocalypse. Meanwhile, only two of the Four Knights are smiling because that's in their personalities, and the more cautious or more leader type of the Four Knights are looking on with awe and intrigue and somewhat preparation as if they are about to fight. Really, really cool. I like it. However, enough just talk about the color pages for way too long. Let's hop into the chapter itself. So yeah, we well, finally get to see... Meliodas is finally taking notice, you know? The, the city's on fire. <laughs> like, dude. You, you're way, way, way stronger than Monspeed at this point. You, This is literally in your kingdom. You should have sensed that, my boy. I guess that's the thing, right? We, we're, we're constantly in the comment section fighting over giving Meliodas a pass or not. Because, like, maybe he sensed all this and was like, eh, let's let the knights handle it. <laughs> this is a knight tier threat. This isn't a sin level threat just yet. Though, apparently, some of the knights are sin tier. Like, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. But it, finally, Meliodas has stepped out. And obviously, the, knight, the other knights are like, whoa, wait, an attack towards the east gate. Maybe we should go interfere. But then Meliodas walks up and he just looks. And no, he doesn't say anything. He has this, like, he has a frown on his face, but he doesn't he doesn't move, he doesn't fly out. Like typically if Meliodas is about to soar off into the heavens, like he'll spawn wings or his eyes will begin to darken. But no, he just looks <laughs> slightly perturbed, like, darn it. That's near the boar's hat. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but like he, he so he reckon I think he may recognize the magic. Because notably he we know he knows Varghese. But then again, the whole idea of whether or not you can tell what a magic is ver or who a magic is versus just how much of it there is. It's entirely possible if you can tell how who a magic is, then it's perfectly reasonable for Meliodas to sense Pelgard, someone who worked with Varghese in the past and is like, what the heck is he doing here? And is much more so observing rather than immediately attacking, such as if Varghese were to show up and randomly start fighting in Leonis. But... Interesting. I wonder. I wonder what Meliodas' next move is going to be here. Maybe he'll show up to stop the jump, or maybe he'll be too late. Like the fact that he's just sitting here watching. I'm assuming maybe the reason he's staying at the castle is the guard Barcher because he doesn't know about Guinevere. And it's possible that unlike the rest of us, he doesn't like. I, like he knows Percival's magic. I think somewhat to some degree, but he doesn't know that it's literally quote unquote called hope and theft of hope away when the four knights gather like he may be thinking of hope in the more general sense like bartra because bartra is hope for the future hope of knowledge of the future with his visions meanwhile percival's quite literally full on hope so i could i get why he may be lingering back he has faith in the fact that the four knights will gather regardless and if he leaves someone like bartra alone or leaves his castle alone who knows what could happen speaking of who's though uh where's elizabeth like it's it's kind of wild that we haven't spotted her at all like we know she's here because tristan earlier in the day mentioned oh hey we may need to take we need to take kai on to mom like to, to go heal this and get this done but she just hasn't showed up is she just chilling in the castle like this is the same human elizabeth that surpassed her goddess incarnation and was slapping around a 50 percent zeldris or 50 10 commandment zeldris like 
She's she is a demon still. So the fact that she's not more active in a battle is making me wonder why. Like, does she, does she have a second button in the other or something? Like, like I don't know. It's, it seems weird that she's just not in the narrative right now, when she would probably be a very useful asset in the narrative right now. Same with Meliodas. Like, I feel like at least one of y'all can stay to guard the castle while the other goes and checks this out. Considering, as far as we know, I know Tristan, Lance. Gawain, like they're all supposed to be like night sin tier threats already, but I don't know. Maybe it would help if the king of the kingdom went out to go attack and investigate, while the queen of the kingdom, who should be decently strong, saves and protects. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not spin. Maybe I'm not spin. However, we cut back over to the battle. We get to see that Pelgard has sort of stopped flaring up. Like notably, he was floating in midair last chapter. Now he's just standing there on the ground. His fire isn't being released anymore. And things are just billowing everywhere. Like there's burning tables. Stuff is flying. It's it's lit, as the kids would say. And we see that Pelgar didn't just stop for no reason. Like he's watching something. And we get to hear, You must crush the evil, rescue the weak, and be someone who risks their life for what's important to them. And Pelgar is shocked to see Percival wielding Dragon Handle while coated in his magic, and totally unharmed, totally unfazed by the flames, the raging inferno that's around him. And I will admit, this is a pretty metal look for Percy. Like, this is the most metal I've seen him. Well, actually, no, not the most metal. <laughs> we saw it as spare Percy. But at least, it's the most serious we've seen regular baby Percy. <laughs> Percy who's the person we know and love. And I do think it's very, very cool, right? Like, this is Pelgard, someone he doesn't have, like, the most hatred for, but this is still, in full regards... One of his enemies, like, he knows Pelgard aligns with his dad and Camelot and all that. And he just, he can't let that slide, come on now. Camelot, <laughs> look what Camelot did to him. So he's obviously out there and he's serious. And I think that's cool that Percy's developed enough as a character that, like, he knows to take this serious. The same boy from chapter five or so that actually fought Pelgard is not here anymore. He's not just going to let Pelgard run amok and him run amok. This is, this is a serious affair. I think that's really cool to see how much Pe Percy still has strength. It's nice. It's nice. And then we get to see that Percy did not just protect himself, but he, he really got everybody up in there. He got Pelio, Golgius 2.0, the other dude, and his friends all surrounded his magic, which is perfectly immune to all the flames raging around and notably he even has his magic supporting Golgius Pelio like in midair like notably Nasians, Donnie and Anne they're all of a sudden just on the ground but the big old bubble Percy's they they're flying they're flying and they're holding up three grown men which is pretty impressive for Percy's magical stamina and strength and I think it's really really cool to see that he's done this pretty much instinctively like it doesn't seem well maybe not instinctively but he actually consciously thought it out like he he knew where to allocate his magic how to allocate his magic and that it could have all these properties really really cool it once again goes to show how percy's battle iq and magical understanding has grown massively due to all of his experience traveling with lancelot and his gang really really cool and then we get to see that Pelgar's like oh well kiddo if you're reciting that, I guess I'm the evil, huh? And I don't know, Pelgard. Maybe you're threatening the lives of innocent civilians by exploding yourself with fire and invading another kingdom and trying to kidnap a 16-year-old who looks like he's five. Like, I, obviously you're the evil, Pelgard. I love you, man, but put two and two together. And we get to see, once again, Percy's like, yo, Pel, Godfather, let me level with you real quick. I don't really hate you, Eddie. I don't really hate you. I just hate the people you choose to associate with. <laughs> like, that's essentially what Percival says. He's like, you, you're pretty cool, man. Not gonna lie. Minus the homicide. Minus the homicide. But you, you work with my dad and King Arthur. That's two red flags and one might as well make it three. I can't trust you, my boy. And Pelgard's like, huh, wow. You don't hate me? Darn, bro. You don't know how much that means to me, bro. That's mad kind. And we see Pelio is like, it's too reckless to fight alone, boy. Neither prophecy or not, you don't know that man's magical force. Pelio, you didn't know that man's magical force. Hmm? 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 Which one of you let him walk over and put his armor back on and get his weapon up? Hmm? Hmm? Who couldn't recognize his magical force at first and then got into a boxing match with him? Hmm? 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 Because it wasn't Percival. Who tried to fight Pelgard alone in the first place? Hmm? Hmm? Wasn't it you, buddy? Buckaroo, Palio, without your blade, without your weapon? Hmm? And who got saved? Huh? Who's floating in the air right now in someone else's magic? Hmm? Hmm? Because I don't think it's Percival. 
First of all, chillin'. He flexing on the ground right now. Meanwhile, you're the one yelling at him. Hmm? I feel like maybe you need to step down, bro. Maybe your fodder. Maybe Ghost didn't train you well enough. Maybe you should get your bread. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Pel. I love Pelly. I don't know. Why, I don't know why I'm going on that man's lore. But like he is, he is trying to discredit Percival here when he is literally getting backpack. Like he's literally in a pack behind Percival's back. So obviously he has no room to talk right now. And we get to see that with that all being done, Pelka's like, well, if you don't hate me and you ain't gonna come with me willingly, I'll just take you back by force. And he calls out Percival's tagline. Percival, the lad with green hair, like a set of bird. Mm. Percival, the lad with green hair with a set of bird-like wings. Or no, with set like bird wings. And <laughs> I, I know what this leads into. It's supposed to lead into, like, all <laughs> the, the Night of Prophecy lines. But it is very interesting to, for him to refer him to like that in general. And we get to see that Percy's like, yeah, um, I'm not going without you. I'm not, I'm, no, I'm not going with you without consent. Because consent matters! And he goes a swing on him with the enchantment. He wraps his magic in his blade. And I, once again, it's cool. Like, I'm acknowledging it. And even Pelgar is acknowledging, like, huh, an enchantment. You've grown, I see. Obviously, man. But I think it's really, really cool that even Pelgar is willing to respect it. And then we get to see Pelgar, once again, he's not moving physically. He's just using his magic, because I guess the effects of Pelio's magic are still on him. So he sends out Immortal Fire. And we see that Percy manages to slice it. He cuts it in half, and then the fire goes everywhere. And honestly, Immortal Fire. But does it stop the regeneration of Immortal? <laughs> mm -hmm. Let me know. Let me know, Pelgard. Let me know. Mm -hmm. You got it. You got, I, if only we had an immortal to test it on. Hmm? It'd be a shame if Nakama had a perfectly good immortal. They just had to get rid of for absolutely no reason. I, it would be it would be such a shame, wouldn't it? It would be an atrocity, if you will. It would be it would be a disservice and a disgrace. How wild. How inept. How foolish it would be to get rid of such a resource. Luckily, I'm not some. <laughs> luckily, I'm not that foolish, and I would never do such a thing. However, Nakama did. So we get to see that as Percy cut shuts. Cuts, shuts, and... I was about to say a whole bad word. But, like, as Percy destroys the fire, he notices, like, oh, wait a minute. The, the things I attack don't usually do that. And we get to see that Pelgar's like, uh, bro, you realize, like, it may have been a year in real time, but at best it's been, like, a week. Did you forget? My flames track their target until it's burned alive. And we see the many different flames swirl and whirl around Percival. But once again, Percival, once again, showing his... Per per once again, Percival, once again, <laughs> but Percival showing his development again is managing to slice through more of the fire, even with his magic blade, or especially with his magic blade. But obviously, every time he hits the fire, it just keeps splitting into more and more fire. But like, Percy, like I, I, I like what he does here instead, but dude, why don't you just re-coat your entire body in magic, or just eat the damage and then heal the damage off? Like... Just simply attacking it, obviously, is not going to work. Just defend. I don't know. Well, I guess this is his form of defense. Percy still isn't too battle smart. And we get to see his squad is like, wait, we need to go help him. But Donnie po points out the very obvious fact of like, hey, um, I don't know about you and what you realize, but if we were to step out of this little bubble bubble, um, we're going to get cooked, roasted alive, like flop. I'm about to say like fried duck, but literally... They wouldn't do too well, but Donnie, and Broski. I, I mean, maybe Pelgar's out of, maybe he's out of your range. But could you try like throwing one of the fireballs at him, especially considering he's immobilized right now? Like I know it wouldn't do anything to him, but you could at least maybe like try to reduce the number by using your magic. I don't know, I don't know why you're just kind of sitting there. You're like you have range magic, my boy. Do something with it. But that doesn't that doesn't even need to happen because we get to see. Well, <laughs> Percy's magic. It's a, it's a bit weird, but it gives Pelgar's magic to... <laughs> like, it gives Pelgar's magic the ultra omega got got slop, slop got nine billion trillion quintillion. And even Pelgar's like, whoo, what that mouth do? But of course, we see that Super Percy managed to suck up all the flame. Which is pretty cool. Once again, he can't use it. That's the thing. Like, Mini Percy 
can, or Mega Percy, I guess, because this is way bigger than normal Percy. But Mega Percy would kind of just have to exist with the flame. Like, I know Percival's, ma I mean, reasonably, I wonder why this thing didn't take on the properties of the fire. Like, I know Percival absorbed the ancient dragon fire, just fired it right back out. But we know that Percy's magic can take on the properties of other magic. So the fact that this Mega Percy didn't just become flame magic, considering it didn't instantly reject the fire within it. Interesting. I wonder if there's like certain properties, like maybe only certain elements are compatible directly with Percy's magic, like poison and electricity, or maybe Percy just didn't think to do it. Who knows? <laughs> That's the thing with hope magic. It's kind of just, it is it, quite literally, it is just what the plot demands for at that moment. So I guess it, the plot just didn't demand that it absorb the fire magic. And we get to see that interesting, but Pelgard can move his hand. That's interesting. Because uh, maybe, well, then again, maybe he's just telling his hand down and it's going up. But once he does that, all the flames within the Mega Percy start to turn up the heat. And we see that it bursts into. <laughs> and, uh. So, Arthur. So, so we just steal him now? We just committing theft? live on air like this too like like just just because you change the, the second word does, doesn't mean that I know what that is I've seen it before I've witnessed it myself with my own two eyes you you so so you were mad at the goddesses and the demons for having certain strats so your solution was to copy those strats mon speed rolling over in his reincarnation right now like come on now Meliodas is watching with a grain of salt. Like, he's like, hold on a minute. I got the copyright that. Like, I, Zelda's down, down the demon realm right now. Like, is there a copyright in front of me going on? Like, I know some someone's got to sue. I got to sue. Like, I'll hop into the I'll bring out the, I'll bring the court case myself. Because that's that's got to be cheating. That's got to be illegal. And, like, this wouldn't even be the first time he's just stealing clout. Look at Ironside. Hmm? What's Ironside's magic? Light crosses. You know what else with well, light crosses? A, a certain Luda shell. Who is Ludish? Oh, oh what, what, would you think that? He's a top goddess. Huh. Wild, isn't it? Two of Arthur's top lieutenants wielding dark and light magic? Hmm. Interesting. And they happen to be the signature dark and light magic of some of the strongest beings of the respective races that he despises? Hmm. Quite interesting. Could it be possible? That Arthur is reallocating certain individual abilities of specific species to some of his knights in order to enhance them because he knows they are inherently superior to whatever human magic that they would have had? Because the demons and the goddesses and all the other races are simply built different? I wonder. But no, but this seriously does look exactly like Hellblaze. Like, not gonna lie, it straight up looks like it. The only difference is that sort of fire that is present right here, it's a lot more... I, I spent so much time trying to think of a better word. Gooey. <laughs> like, it, it seems like it's quote-unquote a roaring flame. But it's not very flame-like. It's kind of like a contained explosion that has, like, liquid mass coming off of it. Like, I don't I don't know. It's a, very, it's a very strange... Like, it's a ball of fire, all right, but there's no tail. There's no, like, arcing bits of fire. Weird. Very, very weird. However, obviously, this magic is quite toasty. Because it it's weirdly toasty too. Now I look at it, because well maybe Percy put more, more actually no 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 never mind I think they're still they're still in there, but the it was so lit if you will <laughs> that the fire literally burned away the magic, and now obviously all the knights are asking well how are you gonna defend against that like if it's that strong and that hot what do you do, and we see. Percival, with the hopeful, optimistic character being like, right now, I'm too weak to beat him. I'm, I'm sorry, Donnie, and Nauseans, I need you to perish so I can access my true strength of death. Like, 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 I know Percival would never do it, but can you imagine if he turned around and was like, hold on, guys, I need more than your hope. I need your life. And just, just suck their life out and then proceed to attack Felgard. Like, once again, we don't know, we don't actually know which one is stronger. I'm assuming Despair Percy would be stronger. And it, just because he could keep absorbing life and he's not constantly releasing it. Like, he's, like, 
for those who read the Dragon Ball Super manga, y'all know how Goku and Vegeta can, like, concentrate all their ki inside themselves. Like, whenever they go, what, what like, per perfect Super Saiyan Blue, whatever, perfect, perfected Blue. Like, that's what I'm assuming the despair state is. Like, Percy's hope magic, as crazy as it is and as cool as it is, it seems very wasteful. Like, it's not concentrated at all. There seems to be so much excess. Like, I feel like a big part of Percy will be, like fine-tuning it and controlling it down. Meanwhile, his despair state seems perfectly built for that. Like, all it does is... Zoop. Like, it's just a... It's like a hard container for Percy's magic. So, I don't know. I feel like maybe despair and Percy would go a little bit dumb right now. Like, maybe he could absorb something. I don't know. Maybe he could just grab Pelgar's throat and call it a day. But regardless of that, we don't have to worry about that too much. Because we see Pelgar is like, hey... Don't feel bad, Percival. The fact that you can sense the difference between us shows how much you're maturing, I'd say. Now, hold on and hold still. As I allow... <laughs> he literally goes on to say this. Like, I kind of was ad-libbing that, but I just read the next panel. No, if you'll join me, please. <laughs> like, like, if what didn't... Ha if what happens next didn't happen, like, Pope literally would have been stolen away. Like, Pelgard extended the hand and everything. It's like, come on, let's go. Off the camel eye. <laughs> like, and the, th and the real thing is, right, because I'm, I'm still assuming, even after what happens at the end of this chapter, Pelgard is going to steal Percival away. This just seems, like, inevitable. But, like, straight up, wh where are you going to hide him? <laughs> like, <laughs> you have missions to do, but you report back to Camelot. You report back to Arthur. And I don't think, one, Arthur's just going to let you just tote him under your arm like that. Two, he, Arthur's going to recognize him immediately. And three, no other knight is ever going to let you just have him and not get you in trouble. I'm really intrigued to see what Pelgar's thought process and mindset is here. Why he's so adamant on taking him and where he plans to store him. Because, I don't know, Percival, he, he a threat. He a menace right now. And he's menacing enough that I feel like he wouldn't just hold still. However, we don't have to worry about that just yet. Because a certain person comes tapping up. And we get to see... Uh, how stupid. Let's rub that out. And then with just a single point of a finger, the massive Hellblaze ball just gets kapow, like literally out of existence. Like Percy looks up, he's blinded and shocked. The entire gang is looking on of like, what is going on? And then you get to see all the knights like Pelio, Golgius, and the other dude, they're all sweating and are just like, what just happened? And you get to see, and yo, Gawain is a titan. Like, 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 either Pelgar's short or Gawain's a titan. It's, it's, it's one of those two. Because, like, the thing is, no, Pelgar's, ti Pelgar's titanic, too. Because, like, let's think about it. We know Meliodas and Percival are actually around the same height. They're both about five feet tall. And Pelgar is about ten feet tall. Because, literally, if you go back to the end of chapter 59, I do believe, we see that Percival is at best up to Pelgar's abs. And, obviously, your abs are about halfway through your body, so double that. And bada bing bada boom, you have Pelgar's full height. But then you get to have Gawain just walking on the scene, and you want to talk about a tall woman being a dubby guy. Like, she is head, darn it, like, remove Pelgar's helmet, and probably his heels, honestly. And she's literally nearly head and shoulders above him. That's kind of wild. And notably, we get to see Pelgar's even shot as, like, uh, wait, what? You snuffed out my flames? Did you do that, young lady? Like, you straight up, like... Like, 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 and you gotta realize, like, Pelgard, he may not be top, but I don't know, his relationship with Arthur would imply that he's top dog in Arthur's army, but, like, he may not be top, top, top in terms of raw power, you know, you have your Merlins, you have Arthur himself, you may have Nanashi still if he's not dead, but, like, like, you have other people that may likely be stronger than Pelgard, but we already saw, compared to Ironside, unless, well, Ironside was very likely holding back, but Ironside literally drew his weapon on Pelgard and struck at him, and Pelgard negged him, like, straight up no-sold him, is like, Dude, chill out. So, for Gawain to just walk up and just, whoop, his Hellblaze tier magic, like, you know, the stuff that looks like it could kill an immortal or two, like, that kind of, that kind of magic to instantly be negated by a simple point, obviously, it throws Pelgard off, throws me off a little bit, too, but you get to see Gawain is like, young lady, how rude of you, you sniveling little fire eater, and... Ooh, y'all know the light pun is free, but no, in actuality, that, that's a ball, that, you want to talk about a, about a, about a ball, like, that's a bar. Like, the fact that she straight up said, 
you sniveling little fire eater. Like, that is crazy. She she literally attacked this whole character. She was straight up like, you are a pale imitation. Like, he, she got insulted by the fact that she was called what she is, a young lady. Like, that is crazy. And you know it's, you know it's wild and you know it's effective. And you know you're built different. When you have Elin Pelgard be like, sniveling. I'm Pelgard, the Black Knight. Like, he's actually gritting his teeth behind them. Gwei is different. Like, I'm not going to lie. As cool as Lancelot's uh, intro was and how amazing his flex on Fittich is, considering, since we know so much more about Pelgard, his relationship to Arthur, his tie-ins and all that stuff, it him getting angry and outclassed by Gawain is ten times more impressive than Fittich getting angry and outclassed by Lancelot. And, it, and the difference is, while Lancelot was casual because he was simply just dodging everything Fittish did while reading his mind, Gawain simply pointed at probably one of Pelgard's more powerful attacks and just went boop, kapowed with no effort, and then proceeded to call him a sniveling little fire eater. That is crazy. I don't know. I think that's really really cool. And then we get to see, yo, know, and I love I love what happens here next because legitimately. After being called a, like after being called a sniveling little insect, Pelgard's like, I bet he says, How dare you? and flexes. And like notably the ground starts to melt around him. He's blazing up. Like the heat that he's emitting would probably it'd probably do some damage. It'd probably do some numbers to your body. Like if if you were in his range, you'd be a bit more well done than you were before, not gonna lie. However, when you look at Gawain in that panel, they're just like at most, their hair gets blown away, and they're looking down. Like This doesn't even bother them. And then the reverse flex is so powerful that it literally sends Pelgard flying. And his weapon flying. It just goes boom. And maybe that knocked like all of the confusion out of Pelgard, too. Because notably, he's... He, he's perfectly normal now. Like He's moving just fine. Like He recovers, and he doesn't slam to the ground. But he's like, whoa. A wave of heat strong enough to blow my flames away? And we see all these little stars that are radiating before. So notably, I thought those stars from way back when that Kion and Jade were seeing in their introductory chapter, I thought that was Tristan flexing. Like, like not going to lie. But no, this gold-colored magic, that is Gawain. So I guess Gawain may have been, like, flexing for some, for some random reason earlier. Like, I don't know why those things were popping up. <laughs> but I guess Gawain was just like, huh, so this is Leonis. Allow me to flex slightly and proceed to flex and then just release these because even Percival's like, wait a minute, gold hued magic. And then he notices that, well, the only individual to wield gold hued magic is a certain single one. I know who he could be. And we don't get to see who we think it is because we cut over to Gawain and she's like, how dare you interrupt someone's romance, you scoundrel. This is what you get for ruining a lovely atmosphere. Yo, so for everyone who thought Gawain wasn't spitting game at that lane, Isol. Nah, Gawain was just spitting game. Like, like, there's no way. He's like, how dare she? Straight up says, "How dare you interrupt someone's romance?" She was, she was trying. To, and I say, she's. I can't say. That's a knockable. Get me a time skip so I can make more jokes. This isn't a problem. This isn't a problem. in jeez, this is a problem in every single series I review. Can I even make these jokes in English? Series? This wasn't a problem. Seven late seasons, guys. Sorry. Actually, it was a problem. With Elizabeth, because like Elizabeth, then it gets three thousand. Whatever, we can make that one work. I can't make this work. I can't make the jokes I want to make. No, time to skip us, please. What are the series? This doesn't work. This isn't a problem. Record right now. I can make those jokes just fine. This isn't a problem. In Dragon Ball Super, I can make those jokes just fine. This isn't a problem. In it is a problem in Black Clover, ninety nine percent of the time. So I can't do that one. And this is a problem. JJK. <laughs> so, so, so notably, like, Nagam, you aren't the only one who's driving me with a problem. But come on now, man. The jokes write themselves, but I can't say them because fear. And, <laughs> but I do love how Gawain is, like, and I'm assuming she's literally, like, she has hands on her hips and is just flexing her magic. And she's literally, like, looking down on Pelgard, which is just, that is amazing. It's cool. It's, the, it's an unbelievable flex. I love it. I love it. And we get to see, <laughs> like, I think tall women are W's. A lot of y'all think tall women are W's. And Percy thinks tall women are W's. He's like, hey, are you Gawain? <laughs> like, 
he doesn't he doesn't even begin to hesitate. Like he sees what she looks like and is like, Hey young lad, close enough. Are you Gawain? And Gawain is like, Oh, well golly you lookers, how'd you know? <laughs> oh, that's so cool. But I guess that means Tristan didn't tell Gawain the prophecy either. Right, well, who knows? Maybe because like I don't know, Gawain has the three like surprise line. Well then again, who knows? Maybe she just doesn't recognize Percy as one of the other knights of prophecy, but she looks genuinely surprised. It doesn't seem like a sarcastic, like, oh, how'd you figure that one out, bucko? Like, it's legit, like, oh, how'd you know that? <laughs> so, really, really cool. And we get to see that Nasian's like, huh. See, I can't even make that joke. So, so many jokes. Like, once again, y'all in the comment section? <laughs> no, no, yeah. Some of y'all are sick, <laughs> just like me. So, like, some of y'all know the kind of jokes I want to be making. Like, when Nasian says, oh, so the final one was a woman. You know what I want to say in that point. You... You get to laugh. No, but we get to see, yo, Gawain really is Miss, Mrs. Steel Your Girl because she's Mrs. Steel Your Girl and Mr. Steel Your Man because they know what, like, both Donnie and Anne are like, she's so cool. When really, can I say she's hot? Like, like she's hot because she's releasing fire magic. Like, she's literally, YouTube, she's literally releasing flames of heat. I'm not saying... I'm not saying the other thing, but I do like how she's she's so impressive off this debut alone that both of our Holy Night candidates are like, I need her bath water, I need her bath water, I need her bath water, I need her bath water. Like both both of them are definitely they would definitely support the OnlyFans. That's all I'm gonna say. But of course, <laughs> I I we don't get much time with them, and because we see see. No, once again, I wonder if this is a sensory thing or a sight thing, because Tristan apparently just up and dipped on Kion and Jade and, and left them with um, Henson's n nephew and flew over to find Lord Gawain. And we see, notably interesting, he's flying with two wings. So it, it I really want to see a full power Tristan. And I'm only doing this just because, like... <sighs> The reason I haven't done the Tristan video yet is because I'm not sure what I want to cover that he... Because whenever I do the potential videos, I want to mention everything that they currently have and everything that they could have. But I'm not sure everything that Tristan has because now he's wielding two wings, meaning he has multiple stages to his goddess wings. So does that mean he could possibly access six, eight, ten? <laughs> like, like, what are the upper limits of his goddess powers? Or can he only do like four goddess wings and then would have to start stacking demon wings? I don't know. Do, do, we, do we ever actually see a demon wielding four wings? Notably, we never actually see demons like go above a single pair because they like whenever demons spawn wings, it's specifically for the utility to fly. Meanwhile, wing status in goddess clan culture is just that it's also like a status symbol, not just a mobility tool. So it looks like Tristan's more so using his biology for mobility right now. And we get to see that he spots Gawain and is like, Yo, Lord Gawain. And Gawain, once again with the sauce, is like, oh, man, you're the person who has that girl's attention, man. You lucky, my boy. You know what they say about the hall women? You know what I'm saying? But what's the hurry, man? And we get to see that Tristan actually has, like, a whole mini freak out. Like, why? Why am I hurrying? Why am I freaking out? Why am I spazzing? Because I told you to wait in the castle. And we see that Gawain apparently is not one to take orders. So, once again, big old Escanor vibes. I respect that, though. And, hey, yo, Gawain really has a whole fan club already, right? Y'all in the comment section, me, the Donnie and Percival. Not Donnie and Percival. Well, really Percival, too, probably. But Donnie, <laughs> I speak, yo, I love, I love Percival with a little corner of that panel, like, oh, so this is Gawain. Cool. <laughs> but, but even Tristan's like, wow, she was a woman? <laughs> like, like he 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 even he's on the mind. So I sold, get removed from the narrative. Now, you serve no purpose, none at all, negative purpose. I can repurpose Anne. I can repurpose Don. I can repurpose Nasian. But you, be gone. You are worthless, ugly, despicable, and foolish. Be gone from my presence, from my thoughts, and from this reality. I will rewrite this world so that you will never exist. No. <laughs> Like, I, I know I put on, like, a, a big character whenever I do these reviews. So I know, I know there are some people who are out there who are, like, whenever, whenever I, like, I mean, I don't like Dobby. But, like, whenever I genuinely cloud on a character or I'm just making jokes, I know some people take it seriously. I, I, don't, I, I don't actually hate Isol. <laughs> she, she hasn't done anything to make me hate her. 
<laughs> like to be fair, she hasn't been in enough of the narrative to justify like actual negativity, genuine negativity for me. She's just so easy to clown on that I have to. And it seems like even Tristan, like Gawain really is just Mr. Steal your girl, Mr. Steal your guy, Mr. Steal your they, Mr. Steal your them. Like she'll steal anybody because she she got she got it she got an honor, and we get to see that. As annoyed that Tristan is that, hey, Gawain ran off and just didn't listen and wait at the castle, there's some bigger fish to fry. Because Tristan senses, notably, it's interesting. He says that rage. He doesn't actually say that magical power. He doesn't say that magical force. He's not intimidated by Pelgar. And it, I, I mean, I guess it's always been a thing. In 7 Deadly Sin 3, you can sort of sense bloodlust, but it's, such a, it's even rarer than consistent magic sensing. Like, the fact that Tristan's like, this fury... <laughs> This raging, f <laughs> what's a? Uh, why did I? I was trying to. Th I thought there was a Dragon Ball game named Raging Fury. Maybe there is. Or there's something. There's there's something Fury Dragon Ball related. But I I was gonna say Raging Blast, but this Raging Blast of Fury and Rage. Who is that? And we get to see that Pelgard is obviously a little bit annoyed because, well, obviously he just got blown off, shown off, like out showed off in his own magic type. And his whole plan to steal Percy is obviously going pretty southward with all these random people showing up that can outclass him. And the like button is free, by the way. Also, the subscribe button. It would greatly help me out if you hit both of those. But we get to see that, you know, this, honestly, this is the coolest moment in the entire chapter. I'm really, I'm seriously not going to lie to you. This is by far the coolest moment in the entire chapter. But we see when Tristan asks who's releasing that rage and he sees Pelgard there. Percival answers him readily. Like, he's like, oh, what? look out. He's one of Arthur's men. And Tristan goes, what? <laughs> like, notably, the what seems to have some shot to it. Like, the panel's so small that you can't necessarily get an emotion out of it. But we get, a like, the whole t tone shifts. Like, Tristan turns back. And even Pelber, once again, kind of like how Gawain had earlier, he has those lines of surprise. And we get to hear Tristan say, "Oh, well, let me see if I can get this one. So you haven't learned your lesson yet. You despicable knight of chaos. And Tristan pops out the cut. Dual eye, dual shark. Yo, I'm not gonna lie. I straight hopped out my seat. Once again, check out the Patreon if you want live reactions. Lows a dollar a month. You get those automatically. But like, yo, the, the sheer, like, I don't know what about it. It's just because it was held off for so long. Like, just the mystery on whether or not he could do it. And notably, like, I saw the spoilers, too. I don't know why this got me so hyped. Like, I saw the spoilers with all of them, but I guess maybe I just wasn't sure if that was actually a demon eye because the spoilers weren't all too clear. Like, the ink wasn't fully in there. So I thought, oh, maybe that's just his regular eye. And Nakama forgot to draw the Triskelion or something. But no, it is so. There's something that hits so different about seeing the demon eye and the goddess eye built into the same face. Like, and I know Tristan said this with such impact and velocity, like to the point where I said it too. Because even Gawain is like, whoa, hold on now. <laughs> like, Gawain, by far the most confident of the knights we've seen so far outside of Lancelot. She, she even she's like, hmm. Okay, okay, okay. So, so, so you do got something to you, Prince Tristan. All right, like she's a little intrigued. Yo, why am I this early? Like, and notably, I'm never. Then again, I read. I love Archie comics. Like, fun fact, I, I, I know I rarely ever talk about romance manga. Like, I've, I've made one video about wanting y'all to read Blue Lock, and I need. To, I want to talk about that series more. But like. I do love Archie comics, so, like, the way that Gawain has a, oh, like, a reaction to Tristan flexing here, I definitely kind of want to love triangle between Gawain, Isol, and Tristan. Just, I don't know, I think it'd be so cool. But regardless, we get to see that Pelgord is like, oh, no. <laughs> like, he doesn't necessarily have an oh, no reaction, he's like, demon and goddess magic, which means you are a boy with holy and dark power in your eyes. Like, <laughs> Like, Pelgar's just now putting it all together, like, wait a minute. And then, it doesn't even stop. Yo, this chapter is so, like, I know the anime. Oh, the, the anime cliffhanger go ahead. Please, please let the anime get a decent studio. It doesn't even have to, it doesn't have to be UFO Table. It doesn't have to be Mad. It doesn't have to be any good animation studio. Just, or just let it be decent, bro. Because I know we're glad this is going to be, like, the hypest moment of pretty much the entire season. Where we get to see that... It isn't just Tristan pulling up, but the dark and light, the, the miniature chaos eyes. We get to hear, I'd bolt if I were you. Oh, no, hold on, I need to hit it right. I'd bolt if I were you, bro. 
you're beyond outclassed. And we get to see on the on the roof of a building, like Tristan's the only one who doesn't turn because I guess he recognizes the voice. Even Gawain looks up, he's like, "What is that?" And Pelgar looks up, and he sees the red fox from before. I wonder why everyone calls him a red fox when I'm. I mean, maybe it's different in world, but in consistently, whenever Sin is colored, he is pink. But we get to see that Pelgar recognizes. Wait, you're that red fox from before, and. He, one is, this is one to get once again one of the swaggiest entrances. Like he he leaps off as sin, flips, puffs, does a smoke transition, lands on one foot as Lancelot again. That is super metal. Like I'm sorry, I still the the, the dual the demon eye the demon plus goddess eye reveal is still is still cool. I hate to say it, as swaggy as it is, I still have to give that to the demon goddess eye reveal. But even once again, even going is like. Oh, wow, that's a nice trick there. Some of y'all build different. Okay, okay. Like, I love how Gawain, despite being as powerful as she is, she's like, okay, okay, I gotta get some respect to y'all. Gotta put some clout on y'all names. And then we get to see Pelgar. It's like, wait a minute. No, no, no. I, you weren't just a fox. I saw you in the Entangled Forest. You're human or some kind of mystic spirit? And then it clicks in Pelgar's head again. He's like, no, wait a minute. It can't be. And then Anasians puts it all together first. And... Then Donnie, and then Anne even gulps. Like, she doesn't even say anything. And that just goes to show how hyped this moment is. But the whole gang is together now. An enigmatic shapeshifter of a boy. A child with wing green, wing-like... Ah, oh, I gotta, I gotta restart. Hold on. An enigmatic shapeshifter of a boy. A child with wing-like green hair. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on. I, I gotta put a Pelgard voice on it, too. <clears throat> it can't be. An enigmatic shapeshifter of a boy. A child with wing-like green hair. A prince with eyes of holiness and evil. And a man or uh, woman with golden-colored magic. <laughs> I'm quivering with excitement. So this is it then? The quartet of fate? The four disasters foretold in the prophecy. The group that would topple Camelot. The kingdom my lord built. The four knights of the apocalypse. Yo, that Pelgar's voice actor better sell it. Just get Escanor. Like, like, straight up, just get Escanor. Like, I hate to say it. I, I don't want to reuse voice actors. And who knows, Escanor probably will pop up in flashbacks or whatever. But please get Escanor's voice for this. Because only he, only that voice actor, especially in English, could sell this. I mean, yo, the four knights together. <laughs> yo, you know what the thumbnail is. It's the colored page. Because I, I, because I had to draw it. I had to draw Like, you've been watching the draw. What? Where? What? Cheese, we're almost an hour. In. But, like... You've been watching the video up to this point. You see what I've been trying to draw. I'm not sure how good it's going to look. This is one of the rare times where I recorded before I actually drew. Usually I draw and then I record. But, you know, that, that got me unbelievably excited. <laughs> like, even Pelgard is quivering with excitement. Though, like, once again, either he's about to get mollywopped or he's got the Chaos Staff or some amp up his sleeve. Because if he's really about to get jump-jumped, like... It's what, like, Percival is standing at the forefront of the squad. Like, he really built like that. Even though we know right now he's the weakest of the entire group. But, dude, you got f what looks like to be. He doesn't have his wings out. But what is very likely full power Tristan. Top of the morning, Gawain. Ready for battle, Lancelot. And Percival. All ready to run your fade, Pelgar. Like, this is no laughing matter. Like, I'm glad you're quivering with excitement. I love, me, myself, and I, I love watching a good fight or a good curb stop. But Pelgar, I would straight up be running to. Like, I would have taken Lancelot's advice and been like, whoop. It's good to confirm your existence. Uh, teleport bead. I would have been gone. <laughs> like, there's, not, there's nothing. I will, You couldn't pay me a million dollars to stay here. <laughs> because, like, legitimately, he's facing death itself. Like, death, he's facing death, pestilence, war, and... Death, pestilence, war... I forget the last one. Death, pestilence, war, and famine are all standing before him. And he's like, yeah, I'm ready to fight. Uh, Pelgar, you're ready to die, bro. <laughs> like, legitimately, in this case, unless Percy lunges in recklessly, I legitimately... Unless... Here's the thing. Either Percy has to rush in recklessly and get teleport beaten instantly... And or Pelgar must have some insane amp up his sleeve because I don't see how he's winning this. Like, I'm not sure where Pelgar scales relative to the Dark Talismans. But you gotta remember, Lance, while out of practice and alone, was enough to absolutely manhandle the entire Dark Talismans group 
when they were freshly healed. Now you don't just have Lance, but you have Gawain, who is just in this very chapter shown off. She's able to casually neg as Gawain's entire... Whoa, so many wrong names. Pelgar's entire magic kit with a point of her finger. That's it. That's all it requires is a quick point and bada bing bada boom. His entire magic kit is gone. Then you have Tristan who wields, who possibly also, like, let's be real. I'm not sure if Meliodas was like, here you go, kid. You unlock your demon powers. Perfect. Let's teach you how, please. But legitimately, you have Tristan who could either A, completely shut down your magic with his light magic, or B, simply do what you do better considering he is an actual demon who has access to actual Hellblaze who could actually kill you <laughs> or you have Percival who can absorb all your magic and then who knows if he actually starts assimilating it and starts absorbing it even more could start amping it. he could just amp the others like if Percival doesn't want to get into the battle himself all he needs to do is coat all their weapons with his hope magic and suddenly you're screwed and don't let him go into despair mo like like I like this build up, this setup for the next chapter is so good. I'm actually not sure how Nakamura's gonna deliver. <laughs> like, cause th this feels like what it, it needs, like a forty page. Like you know how I know this is weird, right? Cause like the Seven Deadly Sins, when they all gather, they didn't necessarily have a big, crazy, final, climactic battle together. Like that didn't happen until the end of the series. But it seems like we're opening up with that now. But the only difference is is that. The Demon King was kind of a worthy opponent for the whole seven... No, he, no, he wasn't. <laughs> Being completely honest, Meliodas could have bowled the Demon King himself if it wasn't Zeldris. But, in actuality, like... <laughs> the Demon King was a worthy opponent for the rest of the Seven Deadly Sins of the fight. <laughs> but, now, as Lancelot clearly notes, unless Pelgard has some crazy, stupid, dumb, dumb, bubblegum built amps, I, 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 don't, I don't know how he's going to survive or make this a good fight. Like, this will just be a curb stop. <laughs> And I love Pelgar, so I, so like, it, it really is a cost-benefit analysis I gotta run. Like, what would be more memorable? Seeing my favorite character to come out of Four Knights get his foot shoved so far up his behind that it comes out his left ear by four different people, or at least three different people of power so great that they are compared to the Seven Deadly Sins, and or we have... Pelgard gets some crazy amps and he puts up an actual good fight. Like regardless, I don't want the dice to lose. I think this is their battle to show off why they are literally death, war, famine, and pestilence. Like this, this is the reason. This will be the name. This will, this battle will very likely be the reason why they become feared, feared in Camelot. Like sure they're feared because they're gonna quote unquote destroy the world and stop King Arthur. But like if Pelgard, the Black Knight, someone of at least decent renown and seemingly high regard in Arthur's military ranks, comes back bleeding, missing an arm, missing a leg, having his toes ticked. Like, if some come, if he comes back battle damaged, battle war, battle worn, bat warmed, not battle warmed, battle destroyed and stuff like that, like, it may just be that time for them to be taken seriously. But at the same time, I don't, I don't know. I kind of don't want to sacrifice Pelgard like that. Like, just let Pelgard live. If he, if he can't amp himself now, let him amp himself in the future, gosh darn it. I don't want him to go. But regardless of that, we have so much in this chapter to talk about. So, first things first, I feel like the biggest thing we need to address is, let's see, I'd say probably Gawain. So, Gawain does actually have full-on access to the same, like, aura flare that Mael and Escanor could do. Like, notably, considering all of her powers seem to be very externalized so far, and notably, we only got to see her use it, like, twice. Really, yeah, literally twice up to this point before we see her do the aura flare. Like, but all of her things have been pointing her finger, and it's been very small scale recently, right? What, she blew up a barrel, and she blew up his fire. And, well, the fire was big. Still, it wasn't, like, massive, cruel sons, greatest sons, blah, 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 blah. Like, it wasn't massive, crazy, flex explosion dude things. But we do see that she has full access to the previous kind of skills that the others could use. Like, that massive concussive heat blast that she let off, Heat blast, <laughs> but we're, no. But that massive heat blast she lets off—it's very reminiscent to whenever Escanor would just boom, and it was a reminiscent to whenever Mael would just boom. And I think that's very cool. So it it would be it'd be very interesting to see her have full access to their old toolkits, but simply choose to use them differently. Like it would be cool if 
actually let me not go too deep into that because now that now that we've seen a little bit more of her powers, I think I am confident in making her like potential video. So I, I won't I won't go too in there, but it's very interesting to see that she has full access to the previous powers. However, what I am wondering is what are these little sparkles? Or it's weird to call them sparkles. But like, what are these little miniature bursts of light that keep coming out of her? Because notably, Escanor and Mael never release that. And while she's in this almost Super Saiyan state where she's just glowing with her gold colored magic, which she does, interestingly enough, she does shut off when people start to approach her. So I'm assuming that is like her heat format. But I wonder if that's like a tangible, visible aura around her or if it's literally just a heat wave. Like, I, I don't know. But this spiky, tangible aura, it's covered with these little star bits. And notably, Mael nor Naskinor really ever had those. Like, their own bodies would kind of... And, and once again, it shows... I'm not sure if that's a higher degree of control, because notably, Mael should have the most control of it out of all of them. He has the most experience with it. But even when Mael was, like, super heated and flared, he would have stuff curling off of his body itself. It wouldn't just curl off of his aura. Like, and remember, every time Escanor was, like, pointing or, like, using a lot of his heat, his body would literally merge and melt and become flame. Like, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Like, the, the stuff would happen like that. So, I'm wondering, possibly, maybe, hypothetically, I don't know. And this is, it's very, it's just strange. I wonder what those little star bits are. And I wonder if those are, like, little mini sunshines? I don't know. I'm very intrigued to see more of Gawain's power set, essentially. Next up thing we need to talk about. The demon within. Okay. So Tristan has full access to his demon power. Well, maybe not full. I'm not sure. Because the thing is, I mentioned this earlier. Tristan has his darkness eye, but he doesn't necessarily have a demon mark. And notably, every other time we saw a demon, at least a humanoid demon, I'm pretty sure even any of the pure demons, like... The any of the humanoid demons, whatever one of their eyes went dark, they would pretty much routinely always spot a demon mark. Like I'm trying to think, Meliodas did it. Uh, I mean, no, even when he had one. Like, hold on, I'm about to go check something. And who knows? There are many instances of demon marks being turned on and shut off, and all that stuff within the series. So, correct me if I'm wrong. But a big example I remember is when Zeldris was fully be being consumed by the Demon King and his presence was fading away and we see Meliodas falling out of Demon Mark. We see his eye is covered in darkness like it usually is. He essentially has the one regular eye, one demon eye. Kind of like how Tristan has because he has one goddess eye, one demon eye. But his mark is still out. Like the, the mark is still on Meliodas' forehead as long as the darkness is out. I don't remember any time where a demon had a dark eye activated and no demon mark. So what does that mean? Does that mean that Tristan just doesn't have one? Is it hidden behind his hair and we just can't see it? Is it really tiny? Or or is he simply not going all out yet? Because we know that you can dive into different levels of the darkness, depending on what you want to do, right? Like... Demon Mark had multiple stages to it for a reason. You had Baby Demon Mark, then you had Second Level Demon Mark, then Third Level Demon Mark, then Assault Mode, and so on and so forth. Like you had different levels of Demon Mark you could do. So is Tristan still suppressed, or does he not have access to a Demon Mark? Notably, the thing with Goddesses is that they kind of just had their regular eye state and their Triskelion state. They didn't necessarily have anything in between. So every time you see Tristan's Goddess Eye, you just assume that's Tristan's max power, because there's... No real way. Unless the only other time we've seen a Triskelion really grow is in Let There Be Light. But that's because I think Elizabeth literally fired the light from her eye. I don't think that was actually just a signification of her power. The only the only quote unquote power growth we've ever seen on Goddess Do, like in the similar way that a demon would increase their level of darkness or increase their level of demon mark, was when Elizabeth grew more wings when she fired off Let There Be Light and had more wings behind her. It seemed like that was a higher amp state, kind of like how Tristan can go from two wings to four wings and stuff like that. But right now, he has no wings out, has a Triskelion, and also has a Demon Eye. It's very, very interesting. And that statement, which admittedly some people are already contesting, and I know, I'm, I'm going to take it, but the statement that Tristan made two chapters ago, I do believe, that Lancelot may be stronger than him, I mean, it makes sense. Like, like to be fair, but no. But to be fair, it does make perfect sense that uh, that Lancey, Poe, you know, he would he would be a name. Well, no, but in actuality, it would make sense because Lance should have some access to the same powers that Tristan does, considering he was trained by Chaos or the Lady of the Lake. 
And I, with with that being said, if we're gonna transition away, but I, think, I don't know. Like I really, I'm interested to see. But to wrap up the Tristan point, I'm very interested to see what powers of darkness he has, because if he if he has the same level of skill and raw power that he does with his goddess powers, remember remember how big Twinkling Star was when he used it on Percival. We in for a treat when we get to see this man start flexing with his dark constructs. If you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying. You know what hell place here or there could go dummy, could go stupid. Kind of like the like button. Goes dummy and goes stupid. Also, the subscribe button goes dummy and goes stupid. But regardless of that, another person we need to talk about is Lance. So he is consistently switching back between Sin and himself. So I wonder if he has any other, like, <laughs> this sounds weird, like backup forms or... <laughs> Alter, alternate cells because notably we know fairy shapeshift but they i don't think we've ever seen them shapeshift to that much of a degree so i wonder if he has other like presets can he alter just parts of himself can he make his arm smaller like how combat viable is the shapeshifting i know he used it a little bit in this fight with the dark talismans but i'm very intrigued to see and i really wonder how he's going to fight because notably in the final shot he is the furthest back so is he going to stay ranged and just use his arrows I don't know, very intrigued to see that. But still, but once again, it is still crazy that he supposedly is stronger than this hybrid that can amp himself with both light and dark magic. Super excited to see where that goes. And yeah, honestly, those are the major things I want to talk about with this chapter. Mainly just super hyped for next week. Like, this was definitely worth the two-week wait, though. In terms of, like, a perfect build-up chapter, I don't I don't see how you do this one any better. <laughs> like, it literally has everything in it. I have no complaints. I am very excited for the follow-up and i hope they curb stomp him <laughs> like I've, re I've resigned myself to it pelgard unfortunately you must be sacrificed however those are my thoughts please some of your thoughts in the comment section down below thank you so much for watching remember to like share comment and subscribe and make sure that little notification bell so you miss out on any videos that come to the channel thank you so much for watching once again and also also i do a patreon down below story for as low as one dollar a month where you can also get live reactions and stuff for being a patron thank you so much for watching once again and i hope you guys have a wonderful day this is that got the pencil writing off